Welcome. Glad to see you all here this morning. Um, this is the November meeting of the Second Division of Pacific Northwest Region of the National Model Railroad Association, a name that's larger than the group itself. Um, we have one item of business from Rother, Robert about our financial review. And okay. what is it? <laughs> so anyway, we basically uh, passed the review. We all of our expenditures and the uh, and the deposits all look normal. There's no nothing out of line, so they're all satisfactory. I made one suggestion that we have ten thousand dollars in one of our bank or in our bank account in a savings. And over the last year and a half, we made a dollar and forty eight cents on it. So my recommendation is that we take at least roughly 8,000 of it, put it in a CD for at least a year, 4%, 5%, whatever we can get on it. And with that, we can earn at least $300 or $400 in interest over it. Okay. Um, board members, after the meet, if you could hang around, we'll do a discussion and vote on that. Um, I don't except think we need me. to do that with everybody. Yeah, except for me, I got to get home. Okay. Yeah. Something about people coming? True. <laughs> <laughs> right at your, right, right at your So we're going to take this up. a little backwards at this point. Yeah. The last event of today is Larry has um, graciously volunteered or been crowbarred <laughs> into oh, railroaded. Open, yeah. Yeah, he's been <laughs> railroaded into opening up his, his new layout. Um, it is freshly running. Um, Thank you, Jeff, for... <laughs> Cleaning the track. It wasn't as bad as I feared it was, actually. Yeah, um, locomotives now run. Yeah. There are maps on where there were maps. Oh, it's under the, uh, under the, the sign in sheet. No. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. there's maps back on that table somewhere. Um, Google Maps, if you just need the address for your GPS, Go ahead and write it down, but I think we've got enough copies for everybody to take one anyway. Yeah, there's one here. Uh, I think there's 15 there's copies total. Go um, I know I don't need one. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Larry is my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so that is after the meet. Um, one word, if you haven't been advised, his layout is up on the second floor. Very strong banister, good stairs inside, no real difficulty getting up there. Um, and on that note, I believe since I've got it up on the slideshow here, we're going to begin with Greg Baker. Okay. He's going to... In no particular order. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and we'll have Warner after that. That should probably get us close to lunch. The pizzas are supposed to show up about noon. They better. Um, they'll be calling me. And while we're munching away, I'll have uh, slides of Larry's layout, as well as um, kind of the story behind the T-Track sitting back there. I've got a little bitty slide show I put together on that and video. There's more to that than you might see at first. All right. Can everybody see the screen okay? You want to adjust that so it's not, you know, like the last video. <laughs> <laughs> Great video of Kree's where I'm just looking at. That's okay. You're a black blob because you're back, totally backlighted. It's even better. There we go. All right. Uh, so I'm I'm Greg Baker, Mountain Goat Greg. Uh, been working on a layout at my house for a little while. I had to build a build a room first, um, you know, small thing. Uh, so I'm a, a prototype modeler, but uh, one of the things that, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're modeling uh, you know, a prototype or anywhere, there's gonna just be some compromises, some compression and, and whatnot. So this is a little bit about kind of my thought process and how I kind of go through what I'm deciding to model, what I'm deciding to keep, what am I, what am I to see? So, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about compression. 
Okay. Impression, compromise, and then open up questions at the end. Woo All right, so I am modeling uh, the Wilbridge area of Oregon, which is Northwest Portland, for anybody who's never been there before. Uh, it's a very nice industrial area. Uh, so I'm modeling in 1968 uh, because I like uh, all the different roads that ran through there. So I have uh, uh, GN, NP, SPNS uh, all made their way their way through there, along with the Terminal Railroad. Um, so I do a lot of research. I was so you can do the math quickly. I was born in 1981. I modeled 1968. So obviously, I've never seen any of this stuff operating in real life. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time on the internet. <laughs> Uh, looking up things and finding things and asking questions and um, finding stuff. So I found this found this uh, map of the Wilbridge area, which I love that somebody, you know, this is an official map and someone wrote Portland on it and then very officially scratched it out and then wrote Wilbridge. So, you know, that's, you know, <laughs> a good document there. So this area here um, and the area we're going to discuss is right under the word well, I'm trying to figure out where my bearings are. Yeah, right, right in there. So down, down in there. So, so this is kind of the, my area of interest for this discussion. Um, oh, here's the actually. This is what I looked at. So this diamond is here. Um, there's a little train order office and whatnot. So, in order to, hey Greg, one, yeah, one question. Where's I five in relation to that? Is that to the right? I-5 would be slightly outside that window. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a long right. ways away. So this is okay. St. Helens Highway. So if you want to take okay. the scenic route to Astoria, you take St. Helens Highway. Uh, Willamette River's here. Okay. The St. John's Bridge is way a couple down. miles that direction. Okay. So I give you a give you bearing where you're at. I'm orientated. Okay. So this map is one of five, six maps that I'm kind of using. So this is, you know, one inch equals a hundred feet. So this thing in like prototype lays out on this entire table, like it's a big map. They're kind of cool if you ever get them. Um, so this area would be, you know, 1600 feet by 600 feet actual. So if I wanted to just model just this portion, I'd have to have an area that's 18 feet by six, just to model just that, which, is a pretty big area to uh, just fill in. And it's bigger than my space by quite a bit because I only have an area that is 11 foot by 15 foot to do everything I want to do. So obviously it's not all going to fit. So what am I going to keep? Let me go to the next. So facts in hand is clear that some compression will need to be utilized unless I have an empty Walmart, which they don't have those just sitting around, plus unlimited time and unlimited money which uh, I've yet to win the lottery and I still have a wife and kids and a job and all of that. So I'm going to have to use some pressure, but, but how do I choose? So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about impression. So this is some common terms that you'll see in the model railroad press, um, given and druthers, uh, popular, popularized by uh, John Armstrong, essentially creating two lists. So your givens are, the physical constraints of your location, you know, where the doors are at, where the windows are at, um, you know, you design a nice room and you forget to put a door in, kind of makes it useless to get in there. Um, gets really expensive to uh, add on to your house. Uh, I've seen some very creative people do some very creative things, but they also had a lot more funds than I had. So um, those are your physical traits. And then druthers are the things you want to include, the things that are the key elements that that you want to include in your layout. So another term that's uh, common, layout design element. Um, this and signature scene kind of bounce back and forth depending on who you're talking to, but uh, layout design element was something that Tony Custer came up with. Um, I think he just likes keywords and likes to put things in books. Uh, specific prototype section that would be modeled to tell the story of a place. So like we discussed, we're talking about the uh, diamond crossing, little train order office, things that someone can pick out and be like, oh, that's that's something that's interesting. I want to model these aspects of the railroad. And then a signature scene is a prototype scene so iconic that even a non-model railroader would recognize it. 
So if you put up a picture of the St. John Bridge, anybody that walks into your room goes, oh, I know where that's at even with having no idea what any of the model railroad stuff is. There's something so iconic, so signature that anybody can kind of pick up. You know, the next. So what I'm modeling, what I'm focusing on right now, um, I'm starting with what's called the Wilbridge Telegraph. It was a train order office. Um, they controlled a whopping three switches. Woohoo! <laughs> so it's a, it, not like the Pennsylvania Railroad where they've got, you know, two miles of track and 70 switches and all the signals. And they had uh, they had control of the uh, uh, train order signal. And then they had a signal bridge to the north, which would be the east. And then they had one to the, to the south, which would be the west. So that was, that was it. Not a lot going on. Um, Control through there was ABS. So the only time they really had to hand up orders was if something had gone horribly wrong down the line or they were handing up orders to the trains going out towards the A-line or out towards the OE. So that was, they watched a lot of trains go by. They wrote down a lot of trains on their OS sheet, but they didn't have to go outside the office very often and hand up a lot of orders. So Nice work if you can get it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the one of the reasons I, I wanted to pick this is if you're from the area in Portland, it's one of those kind of little iconic spots, this little structure. It's not it's not much bigger than a postage stamp. It's a very small building, but it was a very integral building. Um, there's actually still, they're modern, but there's still two signal towers here. It's still referred to as the Wilbridge Telegraph by a lot of the, the employees. It's just one of those. Once a railroad is named something, the name stays there forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this works out that I can fairly easily scale it and get it to fit on my layout without having to do a lot of track rearrangement. I don't have to omit the key points. I can get my, my crossover and my single switch that takes me out to the A-line. I can actually model the entire structure in full scale because uh, <laughs> it, it works out in scale to be about that big. <laughs> so not 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 huge. All right, you can go to the next one. So these are just a couple other images. Um that was for Dave. Thank you. Ooh. That only cost me way too much money on eBay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was probably voting betting against you. You were, you were yes. Yes. <laughs> but I will fight you on my Wilbridge phone. All right. So in the background, you can see both of the, the signal bridges. You can see the little tiny uh, train order operator office. You can see the train order signal there. And then you can see the fact that I'm going to need to buy like hundreds of black tank cars because that's that was a very popular, very popular car in that area. So and a whole lot of telegraph poles and a whole lot of telegraph poles. And then, yeah, these get really wacky on this side. And then on the other side, it's the utilities. And they get even wackier. There's all sorts of stuff that went along St. Helens Highway. There's still some of the, yeah, on that photo you can see, some of the uh, light fixtures are still the same from the 60s that are out there. We've got these really long arms uh, that extend out into over the lane of traffic. <laughs> um, they're very kind of like, I would have figured that out, you know, got replaced. Like, no, no, they're fine. They work great. So the photo over there has that diamond. And the telegraph office there and, and all the tanks, which I very carefully modeled. So you're standing in the tank farm, so I don't have to model 10,000 tanks. <laughs> I'm gonna have all the pipes, <laughs> but just not all the tanks. So so these are the things that when I was looking for scenes, this was one of the things that like, well, I, I wanna have this on the layout. It sets the place, it sets the time. So if you see photos post, 73, 74, being really like silver paint. So you can see that they are painting the signals. So I've got a photo in, I think it's 75, and one of them is about half painted. And then I got a photo in 77, and they're both painted silver. <laughs> so I know it's like, well, I'm model 68, so they're going to be black like that. Um, there's also other little, just kind of great you know, details on that. You know, I probably paint too much for that photo, too. Uh, but that gives you, you can see that uh, if you go next to the F unit there, the brown uh, on the track there, 
So does anybody know what that is? All that brown? That is pumping track. So mud. that is mud. <laughs> so what happens is when it rains and the, the water gets down into the ballast, underneath ballast is mud. And this whole area was oh. built on fill and crap. And as the track, as the trains go up and down, it actually makes, it's a hydraulic thing and it pulls the mud and the crap up out of the ground. So probably 10 mile an hour track. Well, yeah, probably you're going to need to slow it at some point, but you can see that, you know, when they're running passenger trains, you don't have all that splash, but when it's a BN, uh, things have gone to pot. So that's where they probably bring in an undercutter, lift up the track, scoop up all the ballast, lay down new rock, put it all back down. Um, so that's probably due for, for a track rehab. But if I modeled it after that, you know, if I just had that photo, it's like, oh, I'm going to model that. But when I compare it to, you know, 1968, I don't see all the splatter in the mud and all that. No, I do see that they did not do great vegetation control. <laughs> and I've got some other photos where there's a nice RS3 kind of weaving through the uh, weeds with a bunch of tank cars. So uh, it's like, cool, I get to get to do that. Right, what name train was that big? That was one of the pool trains. So this is, oh, I was messing up, 507 or 508. Well, just, so the GN, NP, up up and up. UP all ran pool trains between Portland and Seattle. Seattle. Um, they're all numbered trains. They had consistent consists, and then they would also just have random cars on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. So this the um, operation wise the pool train so this one actually has a dome which yeah sometimes happened sometimes didn't depending on what was going on um depending on the season but this would be part of the north coast limited would come into seattle they'd hack off some of the cars they'd add some different cars to it they'd make a round trip to portland and back and then they disassemble this train and it would be the next day's north coast limited that's what it looks like yeah <laughs> so the other thing that you'll see on like the NP train, you got a lot of SP cars because the NP and SP had a, a relationship. Yeah. Um, on the UP train, you'll see all sorts of different railroads all in UP paint with, <laughs> you know, Pennsylvania written on it or Rock Island or Milwaukee. Um, but it's like, oh, look, it's all UP cars. But it isn't if you start looking at the looking at the thing. So um UP ran with usually either an A, B set of E9s or two E9s, just whatever was ready in the roundhouse. I've seen pictures where it's an ABA set, but that cost me, a, you know, 300 extra dollars. So I think I'll just do it. <laughs> uh, GN ran in the 60s. They ran their SDP 40s. Um, so 325 seems to be like the assigned locomotive, like it's constantly on that so it was great because it was um an it was brand new locomotive in 1966 and behind it was a i think it's a 1919 built heavyweight short baggage car is what they had so it's one of the newest locomotives and one of the oldest passenger cars that they had in service so this little 65 foot single door baggage car and then a mishmash of um 60 uh, 60 seat coaches behind it and like a little cafe car. So. All right, you can go to the next. All right, so back to my map. Uh, that's the current track plan over there on that side. So that little red square at the tippy tippy top, we no. all the way over there, is the Wilbridge Telegraph. So I'm going to get my switch that leads off to um, hidden staging. I'm going to have my crossover that takes me into Wilbridge Yard. I'm going to model that diamond, and I'm going to model kind of the major industries. Um, I'm limited by space. Uh, I use my area as a shop and an office in the middle. So as much as I'd like to have a center peninsula, I'm just going to keep it around the walls. Um, it's only designed to have you know, a couple operators over uh, I have to figure out where to put the mini mini fridge with the beverages in it, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so, 
So I'm getting the key elements, even though I'm only doing it in like a eight foot space. So that's that's kind of what I've what I've had to compromise with. So as long as you've got you know this little structure here, um, the basic elements, the the trains running, you know the, the various trains running past it, and some of the other little telltale signs, vehicles signage there's that the sign from the other one that says draw span one mile um you see there it says Lambert river bridge that's not nearly a mile <laughs> but that would be that's what that uh what that signs for so um you know there's there's a lot of stuff between wilbridge yard you know i've had to compress that because i can't fit all of it um i've had to admit some of the roads that ran through there so i'm kind of taking the best of the road crossings. So there's a couple of kind of funky road crossings with some funky signals. So I'm kind of mushing those, those two or three road crossings into one road crossing. Um, I've got my very abbreviated Lambert River Bridge. Uh, so I think I'm modeling, you know, like one sixteenth of it. <laughs> I'm doing like the first through span and then like, yeah, that's, that's about all I can fit. Um, and then down below is I'm doing North Portland Junction. Um, that way I can populate uh, the UP freight trains. And then I've got the Peninsula Terminal um, Company, and that gives me an interchange there to back feed my back feed my yard. So um, I've, I've got started on it. I haven't got that far. Um, you know, like I said, wife and kids and work and all those things. But uh, it is progressing. I I do feel that getting this piece of track work started and I'm building in sections. So uh, popularized by our sort of employer, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fugate uh, is the Toma, which is the one module approach. Um, I build a lot of dioramas. This is a great way of doing it. If you can't or don't want to tackle an entire layout at the same time, I'm starting with a two foot by four foot section of the layout that I'm going to build almost to completion. Uh, there's certain things when it comes to track work that uh, it'll be easier for me to just not have it on there and add it later than it is to, you know, try to cut through a frog, you know, things that can cause issues down the line. So um, there's that. Do you have, um, are you making provisions for a lower level staging yard? Or yes, yes. Uh, not shown here, but I do have um, a lower level design. In it. Is that what these tracks will go to? Yep. And then up in the right hand corner, that track there. So the space you see between uh, the yard and the and the wall, that kind of tan area in the back, there'll be a short backdrop, and then the track will be behind that. So I can get up on a get up on a ladder and rerail things because whatever you put in a tunnel <laughs> will derail. <laughs> so everything is designed to either have access over the top or from under underneath on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other things, uh, some resources that I've that I've come across. Um, if you're modeling a prototype, or even if you're modeling a fictitious railroad, but you got a short line or a railroad that ran through there, uh, some of the documents that you can find from the railroad really help you uh, understand the operation and kind of what what goes on. Um, so timetable. Um, gives you like a list of the scheduled trains. Hey, that's pretty nice. So when you're looking at a location like the Oregon trunk and they've got one scheduled train a day, you're like, well, that's kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> but you go to the terminal subdivision and you've got all those trains to model. So that gives you, you know, something to look at. And these are just the scheduled trains. So this is not all of the tons of transfers that ran and all of the extras and, and some of the other trains that were regularly operated, but not scheduled. So keeping those in mind. This also has some interesting information about specific operations. So um, this one talks about drawbridges. So it tells you about all the drawbridges. So like the Willamette draw, it tells you what you need to do to get the signals, to get the bridge tender's attention. So when you pull up on a red, you're like, hey, I'd like the bridge to go down now. So you've got that in there. Same thing with the uh, interlocking, that is the Willbridge. Um, 
It's got instructions on how to use those, some of the speeds, so some of the other information. Uh, special instructions. Um, this is just kind of more specific details. So this is interesting because it tells you down to like what tracks who can interchange on. So on my Peninsula Terminal Company, it lists out that you know tracks one and two are are running tracks, and track three is for UP, and track four is for SPNS. So it's like okay, well we put the SPNS cars in four, and <laughs> you put your UP cars in three, and all that. Same thing with the Wilbridge Yard. It's got instructions on where setouts are supposed to be made and where pickups are supposed to be made. So finding those documents are great. Uh, the other thing is if you can find them, and this one's more modern, but um, mm -hmm. these are fun. So track charts, um, not to scale. <laughs> uh, sometimes it looks like a child with a crayon drew these things where they've got these weird like circles and tracks that, you know, because they've had to seriously compress things. But a lot of times, uh, the, if you can find older ones or like spins, um, uh, the SP had a numbering system, B and stole it. Uh, some other railroads made up their own, uh, but it'll tell you like on the back sheets of these, it tells you, these are, this is modern times. They don't do a lot of switching, but it tells you the track number associated and then who the customer was. So you can look at this sheet on the front and correlate the different track numbers. Now, track numbers and names never die. So in, I think this is in late, early 2000s, um, they still have customers listed on here that have been gone a long time or changed names multiple times, but it's still called the same thing because railroaders once we've named something, we just leave it alone. Because <laughs> we don't want to the issue. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to change anything. Uh, so the only time I've ever seen uh, a track name changed uh, was purely for political reasons. <laughs> because it was like, uh, what was it? The state representative owned the, the track and had cars delivered there. And he didn't want it called whatever it was. He wanted to call his name. So we went in and we went in and changed the uh, name of the track for him. So uh, let's see. And then, like I said, I've got a little drawings of the building I'm doing. So this is uh, this is scaled off of actual blueprints uh, using the GNMP joint archives. Um, blueprints back then, especially for railroads, are great because they pack as much stuff as you can on a single page. So there'll be like the buildings here and then there'll be a drawing of a gutter next to that. And then next to that will be some sort of track diagram and you're going, oh my God. So having to <laughs> sometimes filter and sort through. So I could probably print the thing off, figure, you know, scale it down on the computer to HO scale and print it. But I didn't have to like cut out the pieces I need and glue them to a piece of paper. So um, I was like, you know, I'm just going to draw this out, make sure I've got the dimensions right before I start cutting up the uh, Monster Model Works um, brick sheets. <laughs> it's a lot easier to so I'll, I'll clean this up a little bit, uh, make some photocopies, and then I'm just going to cut them out and build up a little foam model and um, start with my brick sheets. So yeah. Oh. Uh, and I think the last one. It is. Woo! That's it. That's all I got. Nice. So what's the track up there? This is my severely compressed mm -hmm. um, diamond that I built. This is the first functional uh, scratch built track I've ever done. Uh, built some other just, you know, just for fun, just uh, for dioramas or whatever. That's um, 100% scratch built. I'm crazy and put in all of the um, tie plates and bolt head detail and whatnot because why not? Uh, <laughs> so this will be back there on that table if you guys want to take a peek at it during the break. Um, this is perfectly tangent, and then this is a 22, uh, 22 inch radius there. So, you know, I thought, well, the first thing I ever build, I'm going to make it super complicated because, you know, if I can do this, then everything else should be easy, right? Yeah. So, um, came out pretty good. Uh, definitely lessons learned, but, uh, um, that'll be successful. So, uh, once this is set up, this will provide access to 
uh, Shell and Standard Oil. This will go over to Gilmore Steel and Shipman Chemical. And then my telegraph office will be sitting right about here. And my layout height's about, about that high. So wow. <laughs> having all the having all the detail uh is kind of kind of important as you're gonna be looking right at it. <laughs> oh yeah, and then I'm also crazy at night. You can see, but I put on all the all the joint bars. I put joint bars on both sides, and yeah, I've got uh, operating swivel switch stands coming from Proto eighty seven stores. So, <laughs> hello, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> Andy's got a bunch of my money recently. Any other questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank nice. You. All right. Before we take that track away, Ross, could I impose on you to do a sure. mini clinic of how you would sure. evaluate, not judge, <laughs> evaluate right. that track for the Civil Engineering Award? We don't judge. Okay, good. <laughs> Probably render a judgment though. So there was <laughs> well on for the civil and hand laid now they really simplified it a few years ago and it, it's a lot easier because now it's a it's either a pass or a fail. So when you're you have to scratch build three different um, track pieces or track work in order to get those three merit awards to get your civil well that's part of getting your civil AP. And basically, once, uh, like Greg's got this all done, all I have to do is take the NMRI gauge and just double check that he's built everything to the specs, both for gauge and then the flange ways. And then when it, it all passes, when it comes down to the form, it's either did it pass or did it not pass? So is it, is it engaged or is it not engaged? So you check, yes, it's engaged. Um, once Greg has it wired up electrically, then runs a motive power through it, both directions. Then you check off that, and he's already scratch built the frogs because you have to, the frogs or points have to be scratch built. You get that, you get the three yeses, and you've got it. And then that passes, and it's an automatic merit award. So you don't have to get a certain number of points um, you know, you don't have to get the 87 and a half points like you do in all the other ones, which, by the way, works out to about a C average, right? Because it's 125 points. You only have to get 87 and a half. So there, this isn't, um, you know, it isn't perfection to get this done. And so if you're worried about that or, or the evaluation process, it's very easy, very friendly. Uh, we'll come to you uh, if you don't want to bring the stuff to the meets that you want to have evaluated. Uh, you know we're we're here to work with you, and it's it's if you want to participate, great. We'll we'll do what we can to to make sure you get uh, you know you get to wear the shirt with your name on it with your MMR number. Um, which, by the way, during COVID, if you've been uh, looking at any of the stuff, um, the number of MMRs has gone up quite rapidly like a in the couple last hundred couple of them. years. Whereas before it took, uh, it went up pretty slow, uh, but now it's going up pretty quick. But uh, uh, Greg's presentation, I mean, you're, um, he, he's also, see, once this is wired up and the and the uh, motive power goes through it both ways, it, you're kind of double dipping because then that also qualifies on the electrical AP because one of the, that's one of the requirements there. So you're, you're getting a twofer on, on your track work. You're getting electrical and civil. Um, the, the track plan, I'm sure, is over 32 square feet of bench work, just in looking at it right quick. So that, that'll meet the scenery requirements. Um, the civil is to do a track plan that you're planning on building. So you've already got that done. Uh, now, once you get the minimum square footage of that track plan built, you know, so you're well on your way to getting several uh, APs all, already. And you only need seven out of the 11 uh, to qualify for the MMR. So uh, I know, uh, Fred, you've got what? You've got five, right? The, the two more. You got two to go. 
So as soon as you're ready, we'll come do your uh, what scenery and structures, right? Yeah, so the good thing is smart enough. To right, there. we'll 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 come to you, okay. you know, and uh, we'll we'll get you across. We'll drag you across the finish line, but we'll get you there. So, um, anybody have any questions about AP or evaluations or no? Okay, well, and winters winters here, so get to building. And if and if Greg had a handout. And needed it, which I don't think he does. Um, this, this would would qualify as author. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And if he already has author, it qualifies towards volunteer. Yep. So they've they've done and they've done a good job recently of cleaning up the paperwork and making it a lot more uh, a lot more user friendly. Yeah, and, I, I uh, think I've seen Jack Hamilton's hand in that. Right. I think he had a, a lot to do with that and um and Bill's easy to get along with too. The the requirements that used to be of mailing bunches of stuff in doesn't happen anymore. It's basically I just email email copies of stuff up, and then uh, that gets the ball rolling. So it's not like you have to have great big packets of paperwork uh, to mail in and have signed and verified and all that. So it's it they've made it really easy. So all right, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Um. We'll now take a short break while Warner gets set up with whatever he needs. And I get his slides. Thank you. All right. Break's the best part. So socialize, please. <laughs> All righty. Warner, are you all ready? Let's see if I can. Yeah. Get in here so it actually it's backlit again. Sure. Oh, it's horribly backlit. Yeah. yeah. But if I can we zoom out a bit. You don't have any shade wide angle. Yeah, we can pull this over since we're not going to be using the screen. Yeah. Um, you gentlemen might want to shift. Because this is going to be in the way. Are you going to stand there? Or... Oh, I think I can avoid standing there. Uh, well, they want to see me. But we're recording. We have been. Basically, we've got the bottom half of your face. Hi. Yeah, always too tall. But this is not a scenery seminar this is not to show you this is the way I would advise painting scenery. What I really wanted to do today was just suggest some materials and methods that you may be familiar with, but maybe not, of making essentially lighter scenery. I mean, you know, this is several pounds, but if that were plaster, most of you probably know how much that would weigh and inconvenience and durability. Being a G gauger, half of my layout's outdoors, most of the weather. So it's gotta be waterproof. Wood is not a good material outdoors, no matter what you do to seal it. So we're always looking for other alternatives than, than wood. Um, and frankly, the best thing we keep coming back up with is extruded polystyrene. This is foam, you know, this is, dense insulation foam that you get at our other half of the hobby shop, Home Depot. Us G-gagers spend more time at Home Depot than we do in the hobby shop because we have to scratch build most everything outside of the track. But um, styrofoam is still an affordable product. I mean, maybe $20 for a four by eight sheet, but when you look at the cost of a piece of plywood nowadays too, it's just gone through the, through the roof. So one inch, two inch, one and a half inch comes in various thicknesses, either blue or pink. pink. Most of it that I see at Home Depot right now is pink styrofoam. And it's a very usable material for lots of purposes. So that's what I wanted to do today was just kind of show you a few little simple technique clues to make it maybe more usable for your aspects. Now, what I thought is you know, this would make an ideal pop-up. I got to visit John Allen's layout and he had um, Gregorian defeated and he had a couple of hard to get to places. He literally had to crank up, you know, on, on stilts to get to, to pop up from. Uh, so pop-ups 
or corner modules or areas that are hard to reach that you want to be able to lift and pick up. Uh, it's it's really an interesting technique to use rather than starting with wood or a metal frame. Nice to have this, something to set this on. But basically, it'll span three or four feet if you do the basic techniques of layering, you know, several layers, or certainly teeing it, making it vertical as well as horizontal. You can probably see on the back that I started, which is the basic one inch piece of flat styrofoam, pink styrofoam on the bottom, and then add a vertical back and a vertical side. This goes in what I'd call an ugly corner of um, of my layout where the track goes through the fence from the glacier into the front yard. It's just a house, you know, it's two parts of a wall here and a fence here and, a, and the track comes out here. How in the world are you gonna scenic that? Well, not terrifically detailed scenery, but I just kept adding pieces of the styrofoam, gluing it up. Piece here, piece there, scrap piece here, glued it on, glued it on, but the trick is, how do you glue styrofoam together? Now, forget it. Wood glue, Elmer's the best you can find. It ain't gonna work because it will not dry properly. It will not work. Now, maybe you're lucky with some of the just um, puff styrofoam ball stuff that comes as packing. You might sometimes get that to glue, but it doesn't really attach to either the, the cheap puffy white styrofoam or the dense polystyrene that we use for home insulation, uh, but you can really use it for layout boards, let me tell you. So how do you glue it together? Well, the magic was in discovering a product from Hot Wire Foam Factory. Now I did bring a couple of copies of handouts if you wanna remember some of the names of these products. I'm not selling them, I don't get any commission from them, but these are great guys to work with, the Hot Wire Foam Factory. And they sell through Micromark, I think now too. I think they're a distributor for them. Mm -hmm. But Hot Wire Foam Factory supplied very relatively inexpensive, and they sell like 25 pound bags of um, what they call exterior foam coat. <clears throat> now to us modelers, it looks like plaster. But guess what? It is multi-purpose. And it's, we mix it like plaster, but you can mix it with paint and that doesn't weaken it. You can literally, it is sort of powdered latex paint. What all I can figure it out is. But even before we get to that, the secret, that will cover all the seams and that'll cover the exterior joints and, and really act like a plaster covering. But holding the styrofoam together, is a product called foam fusion. Now we've found that you don't have to buy hot wire foam fusion. There's also a product at Home Depot called, put out by PPG, and it used to be called Gripper, and it's now called Seal Grip. You can get it in quart cans. Painters will use it for a multi-purpose absolute primer you know, below the paint. we found essentially what this is, foam fusion, seal grip, gripper. It is a white-like glue substances that you can, you can paint as a primer or anything um, to cover other colors, or it dries inside layers of styrofoam, magic. It will hold flat pieces where air can't get to. You can't evaporate, um, you know, water-based glues that have to evaporate the water or other kinds of sealants, contact cements will melt right through styrofoam. Even the ones that say they're foam safe, they're not gonna grab hold of styrofoam and they will deteriorate after a while. We've tried everything <laughs> in terms of the product categories that you can imagine for sealants. And this by far is, you know, either using the foam product, the foam fusion from Hot Wire Foam Factory, or just off the shelf, the white glue-like stuff in a can, um, and it's PPG, and it's called foam 
And they call it seal grip. Now, can it be saying, tinted? What? Can it be tinted? Yes. You can tint it. You can literally mix it with latex base paint for any color you want, or you can use uh, dry pigment. You can use dry pigments. You can mix anything you want to so that your base, think of it as your, you know, plaster would be colored. If you chip it, you break it, you don't suddenly have bright white show. Now it is bright white, so I recommend tinting it. And I tinted this some, but not as much as I normally do. I was just a little cheap on the paint. It takes a lot of dark pigment to, to darken white. So you've got to really mix it almost one-to-one -one, and you'll still get a shade lighter than you're starting with. But I fully recommend that taking um, now, you can mix it with a foam fusion, but, but this is also what you're going to cover and color with, I would recommend, rather than plaster, using a product that they also sell that's called exterior foam coat. You literally mix it like plaster, um, much lighter and much more durable. It's not going to crack, especially where your seams are, and it will cover, cover joints. This hodgepodge thing that I did just for a demonstration, but now I wind up using it on the corner, ugly corner. There must be uh, 25 pieces of scrap styrofoam glued together with, first of all, the, the foam fusion type material, and then covered with, first thing, you can literally cover it with the, the same product used as a glue to act as a primer. You can mix color with it, or what I did in this instance was literally cover it with the primer, and then I covered it with a layer of exterior foam coat because this allows me to also mix in. It's got texture. You know, it's going to wind up looking like rock or cement itself, as you can kind of feel see from the back. You know, you, you instantly almost get a rock surface. So not as rock hard. I mean, you, you can punch through it because the styrofoam underneath it is, um, you know, it's soft stuff. But um, it gives you a good surface that relatively durable. This thing gets knocked around quite a bit. The Home Depot has a, another product down there which they call foam the sealant for foam. Oh, okay. And it comes it comes out with. Uh, it's like the DAP does when you DAP yeah. 230, but it's not DAP 230. It's I don't think it's made by DAP, but it's for using for sealing foam oh. pieces together or gluing to. Okay. Not necessarily big for surfacing. Right, and that's why this this gets yeah. so much easier than squirting it out of a yeah. of a or a polyurethane type or a comes out of a caulking gun. Yeah, caulking like guns. You know, they're one of my least favorite of all inventions that I've ever worked with as a club. Yeah. That's why this risk go old and they get hard to work. And you get little lines, yeah. which you want, especially in surfaces, you want it to be more spread out and even. And that's where you really gain by being able to paint it on. Yeah. So this is a thinner and it's going to dry when it's you know compressed. I'm going to leave it compressed for 24 hours. There's some weight between it. But you can see literally that these are this two layers on the back, several layers on the end, two layers on the bottom, and um, it doesn't come apart, whether yeah. included. Um, Do you remember which uh, the product you said <clears throat> it's labeled for foam, but you said it breaks down and the things come apart eventually? Well, that's, that's some of what, what, uh, what we're talking about here is the stuff that comes in the caulking gun and right. says it's either urethane or foam compatible. Right. Or project, you know, the right. stuff. It's just a mess. And you can't spread it out as well. It might work, but it doesn't hold over time. I mean, you you've tried it and had it come apart. I have, you, I, you don't remember the which trade name the product is that you've had come apart? Or do you remember? It might come to me. Liquid uh, nails is liquid one. nails, yeah. thank you. That's liquid it. nails is one, and you have to be very careful about. Because they'll say foam safe. Yes. And then they'll say foam foam adhesive. Yeah. And then they'll say foam um 
formulated for foam. Yeah. But they all mean different things. <laughs> yes. Doesn't all mean that it'll stick them straight. So, down. so some of them are designed to essentially hold it long enough. Yeah, that it'll three hundred. Yeah. Fall, PL three hundred. Fall yeah. off yeah. in the yeah. head while you're. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're tacky, yes. but they Got still it. rely on a solvent base yeah. that has to evaporate. It will, right. Yeah. And that it just will, doesn't yeah. work it in a large it. flat surface. It'll work little beads, right? But you're going to have things and it will. Fire from itself will come apart. No, the, the, the tube we just mentioned it was PL three hundred, which is explicitly a, a for foam, for foam okay. only, the styrofoam yeah. insulation. But, but we're, again, we're, again, it's it's good maybe for gluing pieces together, but it's not good for right big surface you know, making texture and surfacing. Yeah, the so finish. It's just a, a really handy product to know about. It yeah. keeps the tubes. You know, you few spurts and it's clogged up. Uh, like I said, I just hate, of all the tools in my entire garage, I, yeah. the thing I hate worse is a gun, you know. Yeah. Um, and this stuff keeps, you can seal it, you can squeeze it on, or you can paint it on with a disposable brush. It, you don't want to touch it. it. It is sticky, messy stuff, but it's so much easier than working with, with just try it. And yeah, I think you'll be amazed that it, that it dries relatively quickly, doesn't have a terrible smell, very latex based. So you have to use a lot of it, or with a few beads of it uh, on a surface be enough to keep things together? Well, if it's a whole surface, I'd, I'd want to consider like paint and try to get as much of the surface painted as possible rather than just a bead. Now, are you talking about the that stuff? Can you, that stuff right there when you say that? or, or well, the other sure, part? And I don't have the can of it from PPG, but it's it's called... Um, sure. Grip. Yeah. Yeah, seal grip. It yeah. used to be called gripper. And they, they thought, well, we'll want to make it a little more. So that's what you recommend for big surfaces if you're trying to put layer sheets. Layers. Yeah. And, right. and again, when you layer this, then it becomes really more like ply uh, strength. Uh, and literally more like the strength you get from multiple plies of plywood. That gives you um, just more adaptability. You can cut through it. And that's, again, the thing. You cannot cut through urethane. If you use urethane sealant, you know, beads of it, because here's the other weapons that I do like to use mm -hmm. from hot wire foam factory, and that's hot wires. That's what they made their whole name off of. Um, and you can get these that shape in any shape you want for making irregular cuts and cutting out stone and making lines or cutting straight lines. They even make frames that you can almost use like a table saw. Well, speaking of table saws, you can. Uh, you know, if you're a, sort of a well ventilated place, make a mess, you can use a real fine curved blade to cut uh, styrofoam if you've got a table saw with a fine curve. You don't want to, you know, eight blade. Um, you're talking about using a brush to apply that. Are you writing off the brush or is there a method of cleaning yeah. it up? That's, a, that's one of the great reasons to go to Harbor Freight. Throw away boxes. Yes. It's a brush bin. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Throw away brushes. Oh, you're you're using, using oh okay. You're foam. using those old foam things. Or um, chip brushes. Uh, you know, you use it, use it first, and and you're pretty much done. Uh, at least done for the day. After the day, throw them away. Don't try to wash them out. No, they're so cheap. Okay. So, yeah, Harbor Freight, bless their hearts. You know, if you're going to use something once, yeah. that's, yeah. Uh, that's the place to get your tools. <laughs> so the little disposable foam brushes, like one of those in your hand, work out pretty well? It would work. Yeah. And a little easier if it's diluted a little bit, certainly with paint. Yeah. What do you dilute it with? Paint. Paint. And dilute it with water if you really want to spread it out. It's all water-based. And again, boy, that's what I love working with. I've, I've done scenery with expanded polyurethane foam. Wonderful, but mixing it, I don't care what they say, the smells are awful. It is a gosh awful mess. You mix the two part polyurethane foam and get the right proportions and then get it in your. Now, still, if I were going to do good looking molds, I would probably use polyurethane in, in uh, some of the rock form molds and attach it right here with seal grip. Because it'll hold it'll hold polyurethane very nicely, and then you could work the edges with seal grip, mm -hmm. and then really feel the edge, edges when you cover the, a lot of it with foam coat, exterior foam coat. 
it's literally like, I don't know, dry paint. And uh, mix this with water for paint. And I usually use a little water to dilute it, but mix it with, must have 150 different samples from Home Depot, your whole palette. You know, like at least as much paint as we go through in large scale. I just, every time I see, oh, that looks like dirt. That looks like dirt. Oh, kind of a rock. <laughs> I'll buy another shade of of, uh, of this stuff. And it also lasts pretty good. We keep it well capped and turned upside down once in a while. So that's basically what I wanted to, wanted to share with you, using techniques that you can use by layering styrofoam together with products that will dry and hold permanently, especially in surfaces. And then also, um, the texturing, which is so easy to do with, this is multi-purpose. Rather than plaster, it's lighter, it's got better grip, it adheres really nicely, and it's not going to chip. And so you could literally fill a mold with this stuff. I peel the mold off, but probably do a little more damage to your molds. Um, but it's, it's so easy to apply and to texture. So if you even want to texture this, my, I keep the little, every place I go, I find some more dirt, put it in the oven, dry it out. Wife loves that. But, you know, gravel, very fine, dirt, very fine. My own scenics. Or you can mix it with the commercial products um, or wet to sprinkle it on. Um, zip texturing has been around for as long as I have. And uh, basically what you can do with it, but having a wet surface, you zip texture. If you're not satisfied with the texture, you can always spread on some tight bond three over all of these, because again, these are water soluble, compatible. You can mix up some tight bond three and do a fine thing and sprinkle your, your texturing in the area you want to see. Tight bond three sticks to foam? Tight bond three will stick to everything we're putting on foam. So it will stick to everything that I have told you so far, mm -hmm. which I recommend covering all the foam. Mm -hmm. You don't want any foam left unsurfaced because uh, it will protect it, especially from UV rays if it's going to get light through the window or for us if it's going to be outdoors for three or four months at a time. Um, once you completely cover it, either with the product like Gripper or mixtures of paint in this, it's protected. And this type of, you know, I say type on two would probably work. Type on three is a little more waterproof when it dries, and it dries pretty colorless. And you can mix your dirts and gravels right over it with this, and you wind up texturing. So I, I, I didn't come to present myself as an expert in texturing or, or detail, uh, scenic. -y. But I really wanted to just share with you is the ability to use a product. Uh, like styrofoam, pink or the blue, different thicknesses, makes so many different things. Yeah. Question, have you tried your packing styrofoam? It turns out, yes. Does that work very well or, or do you have don't to stick with the Owen, don't Owen recommend. Corning or the other? Yeah, in my handout here, I mentioned that that's, um, that's the other type. That's expanded polystyrofoam. Yeah. Little bubbles if you break them apart. Now it's really uh, you can use it for filler. You know if you're trying to fill a mountain full rather than our old wadded up newspaper yeah. <laughs> from childhood. Rather than using wadded up stuff and uh, like that, I, you could use it for that. But I certainly wouldn't use it anything near a surface because it won't hold. Okay, so so in other words, you could use it. As a basic thing, and then yeah, maybe the last layer you could use the Owens Owens Corning fiberglass, exactly fiberglass, but uh, yeah, the, the styrofoam. styrofoam. Yeah, I, we call it styrofoam. Or the, or they the call it, they call it foamular now, but that's what this entire building is, except for the roof. The roof is a um, piece of wood, but this is entirely made out of one inch styrofoam, but you then can. Um, scribe, you, know, you could almost get HO brick in this, and it couldn't get smaller, but you could get concrete blocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it makes an excellent base for texture. If you get a good deep scribe, then you can overdo it. 
because you can fill it very easily with this stuff for your um, grout. Your grout color, and basically acting as grout, wiping it off your surface, and then dry brushing, painting the colors of whatever your blocks or cement want to be. So you, you kind of get two for one. You actually get grout for grout, only it's better than grout. grout I've, I've used grout, and that's not what I recommend. You can really use this on styrofoam. And um, makes it pretty easy to easy to work with surface, which can also be you know, made into carved into walls, carved into rock work where you need a retaining wall, or put onto a in this case a piece of star of styrene and made a gondola load. And I've got these with probably eight different textures of sands and gravels that I've gotten, or, or with any scenic foam material. Um, again, using the foam coat, liberally sprinkling, and if that isn't enough, spray it with a little of our friendly glue, whatever your favorite is, and zip texture another layer on it until you get what you want. And um, makes removable loads for us, but could be actually just even a scenic area where you wanted to have a gravel pit or, or stacked up areas like that. But uh, there's just so many different ways you can you can carve styrofoam, and it is pretty soft. I mean, it, you don't just carve it. Usually, if you want to make a good scrap line, I recommend literally using a you know a hot wire mm -hmm. and a straight edge. You won't burn. You use a wood straight edge or whatever, and even hand doing it, you can come up with a reasonable set of grout lines and representation of some block. So the detail aspects may not be there, but the structural, I got my, the structural capabilities of, of styrofoam really gives you like a pretty, pretty strong product. Yeah. And uh, a movable module, actually. I can see this being reinforced with a back, uh, uh, being uh, stable enough, not to stand on, but a bridge three or four feet of distance. And that's only two layers on the bottom and oh, two, two layers on the on the back in terms of the back. <laughs> we make a good corner where you can't get to and you want to be able to lift it off from above. You can certainly fill the corner, mm. the back corner of your layout and uh, still get under it to get the tracks without having to go through a lot of expensive cutting and again, you can do your cutting literally with a hot wire. Mm -hmm. Might want to make a nasonite if you have it. If you want a uniform curve, you, you definitely can just make a nasonite uh, template. Mm -hmm. Let me just kind of cut with the wire. And you can adjust the temperature. You, they come, or you can buy a, a temperature adjusting thing so you can get just the right temperature so it doesn't over melt your mm -hmm. cut and you can cut easily. Three two inch yeah, stuff. So does that come with a you know, power, supply. power yeah. supply? Then you plug into you yeah. plug either one into the either, either unit there. It comes with a little transformer box yeah. with a dial on and, it. And you can dial the heat up or down on it. Yep. And there's many different lengths and sizes of these, and they also have a switch on them. Styrofoam does give off an unpleasant smell when you're burning and cutting. I have been told, though, it is not toxic in terms of cancer producing or something, but I, I wouldn't sell it as that. I still would use it where you've got good yeah. ventilation, cross ventilation, a fan going, and, yeah, do it, yeah. and not breathe all the smell if you don't want it. Yeah, a lot of that stuff is not cancer causing that we know of. <laughs> yeah. What that we don't. Yeah, that's the PS I would put on there. Well, Asbestos we used to be positively safe. Yeah, so I would still, well, I always got fans in our garages, but probably really. <laughs> even where we live. So that's it. Um, I'll leave it up here. You can put a hands on it. But uh, uh, again, I, I didn't I didn't even texture and paint this the way I would if I were really trying to present it as a scenery module. Actually backwards, you've got the dark forward and it should be darks in the lines. But so I you, just wanted you to be you able basically to... carved all your rock so there's no rock mold in there. No, there's no rock molds here at all. It's all just kind of Randomly cut out with a mm -hmm. with a hot wire, various shapes, and you can bend this to 
So your, your cut stone up for a front is the same thing. And that was just limed, you know, limed by hand. So you don't use knives at all when reading? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, have a, I have a certainly a you know, serrated blades when yeah. I want to just, you just little cut some off. Like I got too much there. And serrated blade or hacksaw blade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes that fine styrofoam dose. So yeah. it's pretty vacuum acid. So that, that lives outdoors? Yeah. This is an outdoor module. It's what's, what's kind of ratty. It, it's a, yeah, how, how are you treating the wood? Oh, that's just stained and it's cedar. And uh, I made it so I can remove it, but I don't. A lot of cedar will hold up for a number of years outside if we, uh, if it's not in constant contact with water and drains away okay. Same with make a lot of doors and windows uh, using fence boards. Uh, they literally are fence boards we rip down to the scale size. Uh, no basswood, nothing like that outside. But uh, cedar is a go-to. No, it's, cedar's not strong enough for ties. Uh, it's too soft and it won't hold spikes very well. So you got to come up with something if you're really going to do wood spike, wood ties outdoors. We talked to Gary Lee about that. But uh, so, any questions I can answer? It's just a just a quick show and tell. One we see the different ways to use styrofoam and different ways to glue it together and not with traditional glues. Um, good. Like I said, if any of you are curious about the, the, the names of the words and products, I made a handout yeah. uh, to describe yeah. the word, every step here in terms of covering up. Thank you. Makes me in pain, but it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Useful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and a little bit too. Oh, wait. Oh, no. And if you, if you think about spray painting it, solvent, don't. Unless it's well covered. Latex. Once it's covered, then you There's can use solvent bigger paint. But, don't let this stuff get on raw styrofoam. I was just like, oh, oh, right, right, right away. Yeah. yeah. So even right. very tempting. But it's it other way. Well, and everything else like that shouldn't be sprayed on it. Yeah. yeah. Anything that's solid based on raw styrofoam that would be really yeah. useful. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <little> melt it. <laughs> You'll only do it once. Do you, you repeat it? what you just Walker. said? Because I'm saying it. If not, <laughs> oh, I was asleep. Um, Again, go ahead. Well, this is a, a solvent base, but it's it's stone. It, it really comes out of the cone or uh, the can, looking like granite. And, and if you're a smaller gauge than G gauge modeler, or possibly even for G gauge, it's really great if you spray your cork roadbed with okay. that stuff because you're basically laying something that looks. Ooh. Like ballast underneath your track, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which lets you put off having to put ballast on it until you actually want to when your scenery is done. Yeah, and it still looks good. Uh, they make several different shades, uh, dark to light. Some of it's even tan. Comes out flat, but with these kind of spray shape gravel cans, I'm sure all of you have experience. You better be set up to do as much as you can in one go because it's probably not going to work the next time you want to pull the cap off and use it. Ah, nozzles are going to clog no matter what you do to clear it. So um, consider it a one use go and do as much as you yeah. can in one day or one one spring. So once you've got it skim coated though with your uh, yeah, once you got it covered, this you can use anything. Now you can use anything. Plug coil or anything you want to put on it. This stuff is well, it's house paint. Yeah, and you really coated mm -hmm. coated the exterior with both either this, like I said, or the seal grip, and uh, that's a primer that now you're safe. Now you you've, you've protected the styrofoam and you've gotten a, a latex exterior that you can work with, and it doesn't crack like well, what might be did you didn't crack the heck like plaster would. Thank you. Thank you. No, <laughs> thanks to you. All right, so I decided I wanted to do T-Track modules, but it was like, 
what do I want to do? You go and see these things and you've got people putting Hogwarts on them. There's one guy I've seen several times who has about that length of modules that is a gorgeous scene of Endor, complete with at ATAT walkers and ST walkers and Rebel Alliance troops fighting and all of that stuff. There is definitely a fantastical humorous element to all of the T-Track stuff. Um, there was quite the blow up on MRH's forums a month or two ago about it. Um, and if you listen to the Twin Cities uh, Division podcast, The Crossing Gate, which I highly recommend searching out and finding and listening to, um, they do a humorous, funny ad at the beginning that's, well, last month after Bowser announced quietly that they were doing a C-415, it was about how you somehow manage to build something or collect something right before somebody announces they put it into plastic. Oh, that means long. Yes, that one. <laughs> um, well, after that big blow up on the MRH forums, their joke was about the rivet counters that can't stand this, that, and the other thing. I appreciated it at least. Um, anyhow, so you've got the humorous, the fantastical. That is not me. Um, they're model railroaders. They can do their own thing. I am not going to complain about them. They're having fun. But I tend to be a little more on the realism prototype side. <laughs> so... I decided that I wanted to model the Mid Willamette Valley Intermodal Center. How many of you guys know what the Mid Valley Mid Willamette Valley Intermodal Center is? <laughs> what you are looking down on is thirty-six million dollars of not used. <laughs> um, if you old, if you remember, the old International Paper facility right next door to Wa Chang in Millersburg. North, just north of Albany. That's what this is. That's why this all looks all torn up. Um, because this is I five down here, or down here. Yeah, right there. That's the UP Valley Main. And so on the site there, the entrance is Millersburg or Salem Road back here. There is about a half a mile of triple track laid in here with two concrete strips on each side. And while it was not here for this, when Google took this photo, there is now a MyJack sitting down on there. Like I said, $36 million container facility that I actually did see a couple of well cars there uh, a few couple months ago, they were parked down in this area, and I think they were using it as a rip track. Because, hmm. uh, uh, frankly, they had no reason for being there. Is this this? Um, I know where this is at now. Yeah. Okay. Seems to me a few years ago they were trying to put this or something like this up in Brooks. Uh, this like was the one that won. <clears throat> there were two competing proposals. One was Brooks. One was this. Right, this okay. one won. Okay. And I hear the Brooks idea has come back up again and everybody shakes their head and goes, hold it. We just did and it's not being used. What? Um, I, saw, well, yeah. I saw a moving container. They had that the forklift. They had guys out there one day and they had the container lifted up. They're all standing there looking at the container. Yeah. <laughs> they, there are like three full-time employees at the place, one of whom is a lady who knows how to run everything, including the MyJack. She's trained on it all. So what I was getting to was, um, I look at the Valley and Sled stuff quite a bit, and they've now created one of these over there, at Independence on the old BNS, for an interchange there. And it's okay. called the Oregon Independence Railroad. The shortest short line in the state of Oregon, I guess. They've got a website. They, they've got a plan just like what you've got here that shows, you know, this is what's happening right here. Yeah. All in a short amount of space. 
Uh, I drive by there occasionally. It doesn't look like they've done anything, but they've got a nice website that explains what they want to do there. Yeah, sure if good. I remember right, Kevin Mannix is involved in yeah, that. that yeah, yeah, that guy. And without getting overly political on it, actually, because I'm more or less the same political bent as he is, I think. Um, I have watched him long enough that I am highly suspicious of anything he's actually involved in. <laughs> <laughs> Norfolk Southern has started a new department, and essentially it's a last mile, first mile, last mile. Um, used to be LTL, used to be, it's a railroad to recycle everything. But that's what they're doing, is they're building all these facilities because they don't want to build a spur track down to your building, but they will contract with a trucker to pick up at your door and take it to their railhead or from their railhead to your door. The so problem this is this is becoming a new team track. Yeah. It's a it's a modern team track. Short lines have been doing it forever. That's why I hired a bunch of guys that I know off of short lines to go to Norfolk Southern. Uh but UP's doing the same thing. The problem is there's not enough industry in Albany. So you have to truck it from Salem or Portland or yeah. some other well, location. Well the, the whole idea was that this was going to be closer to most of Oregon than Portland is, yeah. and definitely closer than Seattle or Tacoma. So the idea was that all of the valley trucking could feed into here, and it would keep them off of I-5 in Portland. And 99, and trying to weave their way down to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But so far, the very nice part of this. <laughs> and we'll so, see how nice in a couple of minutes. So do you know why they're not using it or because nobody signed up to use it. Oh. The, the interesting thing is, I just visited this a couple months ago. Um, it was closed, locked up, I think. However, comma, there was a guy in a Schneider truck outside who was apparently, how a truck driver got involved in this, I have no idea, but he's one of the shakers behind the whole project. And he's trying to attract visibility to the fact that we spent $36 million on a facility that's not being used. So if you zoom in, this is Google Maps, by the way. This is what the start of the ramp looks like. So you've got crossovers for trucks to actually run over the rails in this particular, or right here in this section. You've got the three rails, all concrete ties. This is actually gravel ballast in between the the ties and the two strips that the MyJack rides on. And is it this, elevated above the surrounding area or not? Or is it it's a little bit elevated. It's got a little bit of like a grade to it. Now, when I went to visiting, it, <clears throat> was because I just said, I'm good to lock up. Um, it was because I had my drone with me. Therefore, sorry about that. Any of you guys know Joel Ashcroft? That's him. I just thought it was cool background music. I did three flights. The last flight, uh, the drone took over and came back because it said it had a low battery. And I decided that was about the time to end it. I was also pushing the quarter mile legal distance. And since I couldn't actually see the thing, which is also pushing the limits, <laughs> I decided it was time to take a day. Plus, I was afraid of running into that silly light cloud. What is that? Hmm? What's the black one on the lower? On the bottom? Yeah. That's a Calmar. Basically, it's a side lift container lifter. Oh. Comes down from above and lifts it up kind of like a forklift from above. That's what I saw the other day. Well, I got months ago. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I got a dumb question. I mean, they have the crossings for the trucks to cross the tracks. Where were the trucks? The going? trucks don't actually cross the tracks. I'm not sure why. I might, it might be to simplify if you've got to get a vehicle across to do maintenance on the MyJack. Oh, okay. Because there's no road over there. 
And the for recreational use only is because I don't have my part 107, so I cannot sell footage or do this for profit. <clears throat> So if you look at the overall site plan, they've got all these areas filled in with buildings, warehousing, and they have this other track that's going to go in there and all of this. <laughs> Very pretty. But yeah, most of it's just lumpy dirt and weeds. Is the old grade still in there that ran through the paper mill? Um, well, not where this one is. Oh, yeah, but I, it looked I, like there was rails in the ground over to the right. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure they've ripped up anything that was there, but they might not have rated it down either. Yeah, they probably had to rip it up just to do the soil remediation. <laughs> yeah. So all of that just sits there and looks good. You got it. This is the front gate. As I'm trying not to run into trees. And light <laughs> yeah, and light bulbs. Did you ask permission this time? Heck no. <laughs> I don't think there was anybody there to ask permission of. So who runs this? The Mid Willamette Valley Intermodal Center. There's a sign out the front with a bunch of organizations logos on it, including Union Pacific. So you say they still employ three people? Something like that. There actually was an article in the paper the other day about them. Hmm. Why do they have people employed there? Just maintenance or maintenance? keeping an eye on maintenance and keeping everybody from stealing what against I guess the day when they might actually have containers show up. <clears throat> I think they're I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem that they've run into is you can't get anybody to bring your containers there until you have a guarantee of getting cars there and UP won't. UP flat out said that they will not run a unit train to Albany, Oregon. It will be handled on the regular Portland Salem train that runs every other day. <laughs> so <laughs> boycotting it, you're not. So it works. Northbound no. one day and southbound the next. Yeah. And this was after they said, we're not going to get involved unless we're the only railroad. But Portland and Western are right, right across the road behind you. They had actually, in one of the drawings, the preliminary drawings, there's a track that connects from Portland and Western into the proposed warehousing district. But... Well, Drawings are cheap. <laughs> and I was definitely shooting for reference shots for the day when I would build one of these sites. So do they have somebody to run that rig? Or... Mm -hmm. She looks to be about 30 years old. And she runs everything else there, too. Um, Jack, we're on Twitter. Who funded that? You did? Huh? You, you did. did? Oregon Tech. I think it was a Connect Oregon project. Yeah, well, it was a key banks on the logo, UP, Connect Oregon, something else, or some uh, mid Atlanta Valley group, somebody else. Well, you're now a drone pilot, huh? Yeah, of sorts. I decided about this point that I really didn't want to get any closer to the UP main line. <laughs> What I didn't spot until I actually watched the videos later and then went driving past, there's a UP maintenance of way train at the far end of that siding over there. Okay. So you're going to get pictures of the Twinkie. I saw it. Hmm? I thought you were going to have pictures of the Twinkie. Not real close, no. <laughs> For one thing, it's too far away. Yeah. That's an interesting piece of equipment. It's uh... rebuild SD40 2, isn't it? Yeah. And they put a cab on it that is a non conventional cab. And then they use well cars uh, that they've modified that they can run equipment up and down the top of the well cars and pick up railroad ties or set out railroad ties. And you don't have to have an engineer's license to operate that. 
Because mm -hmm. it's not officially yes. a locomotive. Yeah. <laughs> this is off the Union guys to no end. Well, it has a six-digit number, too. So you can see where the, the gravel is between them. So mm -hmm. that's not paved. Yeah. And here's the point where the drone says, I got to go home or else I'm going to die. <laughs> And I very carefully watched it come across the sky because I really didn't want it dying inside the fence line. Yeah. Yeah. That out. Um, I got most of this built before I started taking pictures of it. Um, the modules are from RS Laser Kits. Some of you might remember Richard Shepard. He used to live out east of Salem. Um, owned, founded, is RS Laser Kits, um, has something of a stutter, which might trigger a memory or two. Um, he now lives in Missouri. So I bought the first module, which is the brown one in back, um, at the show in Dallas from him, since he was down there for it. <clears throat> Got it put together, went, okay, this is nice. It's not big enough. And ordered a second one. So you can see what it actually looks like without being totally stained. Um, and also one of the corner modules, which you know, they're sitting over there. This is the corner module going together a couple of days ago. Um, yes, these projects eat clamps. <laughs> you can never have too many clamps. Um, well, they're not on there right clamps. at the moment, but I had corner. I I have four of those corner clamps. Mm -hmm. um, I had them on each corner. I when I you build this by putting two of the sides together first and then joining it all together into the box. So when it was two sides together, I had two corner clamps on each of them because there's also a triangular piece. Um, reinforcing the corner as well as being a place where an adjustable foot is mounted. Anybody who wants to see those afterwards, we'll do this afterwards. Got those holes in the corner. Okay. And this was last night when I actually put all of them together for the first time because I basically put the track down on the uh, this module and this module last night. Um, I have discovered that I did break one of the rules, apparently, because I believe these are number four switches, and mainline tracks are only supposed to have number sixes or higher. So we'll deal with that if it ever becomes a problem. Um, my major issue is if I ever want to play with this thing alone, is getting trains in and out of this facility. <laughs> The other thing you can't have enough on staging. Yeah. I thought briefly about trying to build a crossover module between the two front tracks. But the interesting thing is how they wire these. They're completely separate, and Kato uses a blue wire and a white wire. So on the front track, here you've got the front track is the blue wire, the back track is the white wire. On the next track over, the front track or front rail is the white wire, and the back track is the blue wire. So you go blue, white, white, blue, which basically means if you try to do a crossover, you are building a short into your system. Hmm. <clears throat> um, I'm not exactly sure where they came up with that brilliant idea. I think out of the world of DC and, and track. Yeah. Um, but what I might, if I really decide I want to pour a ton of money into this one of these days, what I might do is build up a module with the crossover that's electrically isolated from everything else with an auto reverser on it. And that should take care of that problem, I think. Check back with me in a couple of years. <laughs>
All right, where are we? There we are. Like maybe somebody was thinking of a single design with a twenty one yeah, well, for each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's built to be complete loops, but basically the front track appears to be dedicated to just running trains in circles for display purposes, which is kind of what they do whenever they get these things together. Most of the modules are display purposes. You don't have to see that many with extra track on them. But again, that's not me. Just uh, no, I decided to, okay, the original root inspiration, um, do any of you guys know who Jacksonville Terminal Company is? They're a model railroad manufacturer, importer, however you want to call it, in Jacksonville, Florida. They got their start with N-scale containers. They've got N-scale containers that beat all we've ever seen in HO scale. Um, They've got ones that HO scale manufacturers have never even come close to making. Uh, they have since expanded into uh, well cars. Um, they're coming out with their own coupler. Um, they've got some various scenic items that you might see around an intermodal facility. Um, if you look down at kind of at the end of one of the modules down there, you'll see the, the kiosk where trucks do the automatic check-in thing. They make a series of those. Um, and as part of the things I do for Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine is first look articles. These guys started burying me in containers. I have more <laughs> N-scale containers than I will ever know what to do with. I have some that are still in bags. Eventually, they will become raffle items, probably in 2026, um, at which point they will be rare collectibles because they <laughs> build them, they ship them out, and they don't make them again. So that's actually what it comes down to, why I wanted an intermodal facility, because not only did I want a place to put these containers, I wanted a place to photograph these containers. Because just putting them up against a white background is boring. But this is the little kiosk thing that is over there. I'm, if you want to see some more of them, I've got a couple more also in the bag. You plan on building yourself a gantry to go in there? Uh, let's see. I thought I had that slide. One sec. Anyway, short answer, yes, I have one of the N-Scale MyJacks okay. that I first pulled out last night, started cutting stuff off of, and the first part I touched, which is an itty little, itty, itty, tiny piece of plastic that will connect the two pieces that ride the steel I-beam across to hold up the container. Mm -hmm. Um, after the second or third time I dropped it on the floor and had to go hunting for it, I put it all back away and said, maybe <laughs> sometime that's not this late at night. I can't name the number of hours I spent with a flashlight on the floor. <laughs> I was, I, my workbench is kind of a kitchen island thing that I got at Bymart. And it's got, um, drawers all the way up and down and two leaves that pull up and then i've also attached pegboard to the back of it so whatnot but fortunately it's on wheels because i had to push the thing back out of the way to go find that little orange piece of plastic and thank goodness it was orange stood out really well against the floor eventually um, so Anyway, that's that for the tea tray <laughs> stuff. Are there any questions about it? Answer as much as I know. If you go to ntrack.org, you'll see all the specs and everything else. I know they have it spec'd out. Have you seen anybody do it in any other scale? I know the T-Track organization says yeah. it's available, but 
I have, not, I have never, any. I have not seen a T-Track module in any other scale than N, but yes, I think they do have it from Z to G. Yeah. Is he still making the laser cut parts? I know he... Richard? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I ordered those other two from him a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, on the other hand, they're getting close to $50 a piece, so I'm thinking I'm going to go to the dollar store, buy some foam core, and use trace over those pieces see if I can't do this because anything I need else at this point is effectively staging Yeah, it doesn't need to be totally free and it's probably not going to support scenery so got one more show here Let's just go hide like this. All right, so when we leave here, I'm hoping that you will decide to go visit Larry. Well, you picked a difficult name to say. And he misspelled it, by the way. Which one's misspelled this time? It's C A L A P O O Y A. There are officially, as I understand it, at least six different, different ways ones. to spell Kalapuya, which involve Y's, O's, and K's. This is named for Kalapuya River in Lynn County and the Kalapuya Creek in Douglas County. If you spell it with a K, it's an Indian tribe. Well, so is this, but it's also a middle school and elementary school in Kaiser. No, West Salem. No, Kaiser. That Kalapuya was up in West Salem. Nope, it's down there. Is that the one next to Clay Creek? Yep. Uh, That's the other one that's spelled differently. <laughs> in Salem, Kaiser, I believe. <laughs> Anyway, so this is this is the Shemekin yard. Okay, so you like, you like difficult names, don't you? I do. Well, well Shemekin is the name of the local community yeah. college. So this when is I effectively got out of Salem the Air Force. I went to Salem Technical Vocational Community College. The second year I was there, it was Shemekin Community College. Okay. They still have a plaque on a rock. Name is Salem Votech. So this is the Shemekita yard. Okay. This is not quite a trip around. Yeah. And this is the first one you see is something called the Lamet Valley Churkins. At one time, well, city of Salem is a cherry city because we used to have lots of cherries. And Oregon cherry growers. Well, at that, when I was a kid, it was Willamette cherry growers. But they bleach cherries and then turn them into maraschino cherries. There was a company that bought their bleached cherries, a little niche company here in Salem, and they made sweet cherry or sweet pickled cherries. My mother got them for me for Christmas every year. I loved them. So for the two tank cars, that's the Churkin factory. Yes. Churkins, right? you've, Churkins. Heard, you've heard of Gherkins? You've heard of Gherkins. Gherkins. Heard of Gherkins? Gherkins? Well, yeah. the cherry yeah. version is a Churkin. 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 The next one yeah. is, yeah. I call it the Eola Hills. I ought to probably have a thing. But that's the Eola Hills. Essentially, Cascade Warehouse is a big... Tracks warehouses in Salem with rail service, but I couldn't call it Cascade because that would be, you know, too easy. <laughs> well, <laughs> and no, you know, I don't want it to be think I'm doing Salem, so that is Eola Hills, Eola. And then you can't barely see it down there. There's the St. Louis near the St. It's a chicken feed unloading facility. 
uh, near the St. Louis ponds where you go bass fishing. So just this side of Woodburn. Yeah. And down at the far end is, is a fertilizer factory. That's my west. Actually, that's the west wall of my train room. This is Woodburn. We'll uh, see it again. The Y at Woodburn has a... It's a mogul, 260. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine, when he moved from his house into his assisted living facility, he wanted to give me his locomotive that he had finally got and cherished. So instead of a mogul, that's a Pacific. But it's still the water tower at Woodburn. And on the other side, there's a, a um, industrial park north of Woodburn that has specialty polymers. They drew uh, agriculture polymers, lots of tank cars. There's a metal fabricating place and a big lumber yard. Well, that's what's on there. And then that's my main line. This is the other end of Woodburn. Uh, where the orange car is, is Smucker's. Everybody likes Smucker's jam. They make jam. And in Termacol, where the white one white car is, is a cold, cold storage, storage facility. Warehouse. On the other side of the tracks at Woodburn, it used to be Bird's Eye. In my area, it actually was Bird's <clears throat> Eye. And so that's how many people can recognize what my backdrop is. That's Mount Angel Abbey. If you come down here for Oktoberfest during yeah. daylight hours, that's their background. Yeah. And so that's my acquired daughter painted that part of my background for me. So this is the beginning of the uh elevator at in Mount Angel that burned down a couple of years ago. But I, I really like the stuff that my daughter did. And then this is the other end where the box car and the propane car are. That's something I call Bill Burt's hazelnut dryer. Oh. Sorry, Fred, but I'm going to stick with it. That's corruption. <laughs> when my Phil Burt's, uh, first name, last name. Oh, Phil Burt. Phil Burt's hazelnut dryer. Is, is it a model railroad if it doesn't have at least one pun? Yeah. And, well, oh my. when my wife's grandfather, great grandfather, raised them, he raised Phil Burt's. He didn't raise hazelnuts, he raised Phil Burt's. Anyway, and then the other end is going to be a farm machinery thing. Okay. Now, where this is out at near Pratham, they actually have a propane facility. Way back when Oregon said they could no longer be, burn grass fields, too much smoke. They came up with propane burners that would they tow across the fields to burn the pests out of it. And there is a propane facility near Pratham, and that's what this is going to be. There's also going to be a grass seed um, warehouse that's run by a family called Stepan that my wife knows very well, and I know. I married into the town of Silverton. And the other end is going to be a, I call it my crab apple, log reload. Not a wood chipper anymore? No, no, no well, not right now. <laughs> this is actually a log reload that's on the Oregon and Eastern at Crabtree. Albany Eastern. Albany and Eastern at Crabtree. Well, I can't call it Crabtree, so I call it crab apple. <laughs> And this is my pearl, the pearl yard. This is the other end of my point to point thing. Way back by Union Station, 
there used to be the Milwaukee Yard in Portland. Well, the Milwaukee Yard is gone. They redeveloped it into the Pearl District. So with my warped <laughs> sense of humor, this is now the Pearl Yard. And that's pretty much my layout. That's Woodburn. Now the, the Norfolk Southern, the reason it's on my layout, the locomotive belongs to Jeff. Thank you, scale trains. <laughs> but he brought it over because my granddaughters like horses. Fortunately, it skipped a generation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and in fact, my ex-wife, my granddaughters call her Grandma Horsey. So Jeff brought this over because my granddaughters would like the horse. And that is the horsey locomotive. It is the horsey locomotive. And my hobby within the hobby is I collect per diem boxcars <laughs> for the for the Western U.S. mainly. If there was a short line in Oregon with a per diem boxcar, it is on his way out. <laughs> so it made that, Christmas present shopping really easy for several years. <laughs> so is that locomotive had sound? Oh yes. yes. So it's, it's, a, it's got an economy it in it. Doesn't do the horse sound. Then. Uh, no, <laughs> they didn't go that far. <laughs> no, um, it has a soundtracks economy in it because I tend to run soundtracks instead of ESU. Um, the fun part is. This was before the NMRA finally got its head out of the sand regarding the whole 21 pin decoder thing. Um, they had a draft specification since about 2010 or so. Um, it has finally gone final and it got rewritten before it went final because all the manufacturers went to the draft specification and went, oh yeah, let's do that. You'll notice these aren't exactly joining well. Neither do the 21 pin decoders because there are certain things about how many millimeters you of space you can have beneath them, about three millimeters. Soundtrax uses that. It puts stuff on the bottom of the decoder. ESU and practically everybody else didn't. So the manufacturers most of what went, went, went to ESU to help design their motherboards went with shorter pins. And all of a sudden, if you have anything on the bottom of your 21 pin decoder, it doesn't actually fit, except at a really interesting angle. <laughs> it works. It's not supposed to, I understand it, but it works. Um, since then, a little sanity has returned in the past couple of years. Um, TCS, you can specifically order their motherboards with either tall pins or short pins, depending on which you need. Um, Nick uh, Santos has the decoder buddy, which if you were ever wiring up or trying to hardwire a locomotive, give it up, buy a decoder buddy, wire the decoder buddy, which is a motherboard in, and just put a 21 pin decoder on it at least if you're in HO scale or larger N scale, you're, I understand there's another outfit that's doing something similar in N scale, but I haven't actually seen it yet. It's supposed to be using the next 18 decoder, which is the really dinky little tiny ones. The, the training the flea is nine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually like the next 18 decoders. Yeah. My sub, my substrate here, you notice is white colored. It's my core which is a sound ending board that they use in a lot of, um, what's this new, cubicle walls. But it makes a good sound ending board for model railroaders. And you can stick pins in it. And you can stick pins in it. Uh, a friend that's no longer with us, that I used to operate on his railroad, turned me on to that stuff. But you notice I've got all of my notes on wiring there. You know, it's, that's on the Y, that's for my um, uh, reverser. It's really interesting. It works. I, I keep track of red and blue for my feeders. 
So is this material is it like in weight? What is it? Not as light as I never had to lift it. Ah, uh, it's not real heavy. Yeah. It's kind of compressed paper type stuff, yeah. isn't it? It's not it's, it's not quite homoso. It's not Lighter, less dense. I, mean, I think a little less dense. Yeah. yeah. Is it as fibrous? No. No. It doesn't. Doesn't. I think it's easier to cut. Yeah. Yeah. Almost so deep. I use almost, almost so deep. Deep. It, 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 ones. it turns into powder when you cut it. Mm -hmm. it makes a mess. Yeah. I don't know if anybody here remembers Bob Emmer besides Fred, but he's the one who his layout was. He used it on his layout, and. I find it really worked pretty well. And then I write, you know, my power district's boundaries on the thing, and eventually I'll paint it over for scenery. But it's really useful for um, troubleshooting at the moment. Well, you're still working on getting locomotives to run around it. Um, when I first started, um, Cleaning the layout a couple of weeks ago, I noticed the reversing district was not working. You basically hit the insulated um, insulated joiners right here and come to a sudden stop accompanied by a beep beep noise. So I went underneath and started tracking the wiring, knowing what it was supposed to be up here. And it was correct. Like, okay, not the wiring issue. His boosters are right down in here. You can see a power supply glowing down there. Um, so he uses a CVP on my recommendation. And two years later, I switched companies entirely. <laughs> um, I now run TCS, CS105. Anyhow, one zone on his CVP uh, zone share, because basically it's one box is a booster. The other box is a series of circuit breakers to split it out into power districts. The first of which is also an auto reverser. <clears throat> Hit the instructions and look at the dip switches and, oh yeah, that one's supposed to be flipped up. All of a sudden everything works again. It's amazing what happens when you read the instructions. Yeah. And what happens when you have somebody who's a lot more limber getting under the layout to wire it? That was not me. It was not. It was a granddaughter. But I was have difficulty getting up and down and getting under a layout. <laughs> so okay. what is that material made for? And what do they do with it? It's sound bending, soundboard oh. uh, for cubicle walls. Oh, I see. So if you've ever stuck a push pin in a cubicle wall and it actually stuck there, it was probably pushed into that stuff. Mm. But it... In some places, they don't stick. Did you buy it or who sourced it? Uh, what was the name of that place, Fred, out there? With that lumber yard in North Portland and Bob would get it. I forgot. I forgot what a, there's one lumber yard up in her building supply. Uh, far, up in, far. No, it's not far. It's but it's pretty well known by contractors up in northern Portland, northeast or north Portland. Went up in Marine Drive and has all kinds of hardwood. Yeah, I think that's got a bunch of hardwood that sells. All yeah, kinds of hardwood. Because actually, my my bench work. I hired a house builder to build it for me because one of the operators that I was planning on using it was a big guy, really nice guy, but he tends to walk into things. And I wanted my peninsula to not move. So I had a house builder build it for me. It doesn't move. I can confirm that. <laughs> and you can stand on it. Why you'd want to, I'm not sure. But. I, but I wanted it built for stout so that I can run into it and it wouldn't move. 
So one of the things I'm also trying to encourage him to do is actually set up operations. To do that, you need operators. So I have to learn how to use JMRI ops. So if anybody's familiar with that, willing to lend a hand. Because <laughs> I ran, I got, I got JRMI, JMRI ops running to the point where um, I did a basically one move where it was, okay, I wanted this car to come from Salem Yard to Minto Interchange, where it would then get grabbed by a train to go to Vancouver. The MRI Ops took this car from Salem to Minto and back to Salem again. At which point I decided I'm going to need another solution. Oddly <laughs> enough, that does tend to be the solution. Um, Richard Kirshner, our former former assistant superintendent and now the vice president of the region, um, made up a very nice little access program. So if you have Microsoft 365, um, or as some people call it lately, Microsoft 310, because that's about how much it runs sometimes. Um, anyway, if you have access to access, it's a really nice traffic generating program because it does not care about your trains. That's your problem. All it cares about is industries getting cars. And to a certain extent where those cars are, or at least where they're coming from. It cares not a whole lot about where they go in between. It's, it gets them on their layout to the destination. It says how long they stay there. And then it says where they go from there to get off the layout, um, which makes it really simple because you don't have to tell the program what your layout is as much. I mean, JMRI ops, you're in there telling you the program what all the lengths of your sightings are so it knows how many cars it can put on them. This program doesn't care. You give it a number to toss into its randomizer, basically, of how many cars or how often you would like cars and how many of them to send you every so often. And it'll pull that number. If the randomizer happens to pull it so that there's too many cars going to that place that it can fit, well, that happens on the real railroads too. Deal with it. What's the name of that program? Oh, Kirshner built it. Yeah, Kirshner built it. It's didn't he have it's an MRH, isn't it? Yeah. Um actually I think he ended up in running extra. But um we can get it from him. He's actually I'm running version three. He has it up to version five. The problem being he never wrote the program that would take the data from version three and convert it into version five. And I looked at version five and went, you know, this is doing things I don't really care about. So I'll just stick with what I've got running. And does anybody have anything else for the group? Are you gonna tell them how to get to my place? There are maps Directly. back there. Good. Yeah. Um, it is that way, about five and a half miles. Actually, the easiest way to get there is take this road, 17th Street, to where it tees on the Silverton Road, turn right, and follow Silverton Road up all the way to 45th Avenue. There's a Methodist church on the on the left. Turn oh, to the left you. on 45th Avenue. Go to what's called Ward Drive. There's a school right there. Turn right, go to the next stop sign. Turn left on 47th to the next stop sign. Turn right on Jade and I'm the third house. Oddly enough, that is exactly the route the map is taking you because I told it to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very simple to drive that way.